and it's if, if we look for quick fix solutions, it will break down really quickly. So we are looking at long-term proper solutions that we can you know, say that we actually thought about it. When they diverted the sewage, you're saying that they have been, where, where are they diverting the sewage? So it circumvents each lake, and then it goes through that Rajkal way, the, the stormwater drain, and then goes to the next lake, as I showed you. So it goes from, and then from South Kare, it's connected to Bellandu, which is that thousand acre lake that I was talking about. So the general process was this whole maybe not in my backyard thing. So now we are trying to reverse that by allowing some of the sewage in, by mining it. But then those are resource intensive processes that you have to get money and all of that. Um, for this lake, till last year, we had uh, funding. We spent 1.7 lakhs a month looking after this lake. Um, and we used to get, uh, this year we get 50% of the funding from corporates and 50% is community funded. So a lot of our work, we also want to get the community to actually come forward to either give in kind or in cash or whatever. And we have audited accounts and all of that, but that's the boring part of the work. Sorry, I missed the first part. How did this happen? How did the lake go? So in general, all all lakes in India, uh, in the so urban or the rural context, it, is always inundated with sewage first because lakes are low lying and we don't have proper systems to manage our sewage well. And if we had thought about those kind of things when we are planning cities and when our planners plan cities, then we could avoid these things. But uh, anywhere from Guwahati to here, that's what's happening is our sewage water. I'm interested in. Um if I heard right, the, the succession plan or the, the events, the succession events that have happened. So this young group that Munchu was in, is this, has this been created because of um, your initiative from the lake or uh, is this group? Oh, Biome, no, no. Yeah. Biome itself is a separate group and it's headed by a person called Vishwanath. He's known as Zen Rain Man in Bangalore. If you see, you read the Hindu newspaper, he yeah. writes on it and uh, he is a, he's just a font of lots of information and knowledge. And so we just like parasites, we go and we just put something with knowledge, right? Okay. And so uh, he is part of that group. So in terms of that, is there a succession plan where young people will... Ah, right. Oh, well, I'm sorry. I misunderstood the question. Okay, so one of the things we are trying to create is to, I personally, I'm trying to make myself redundant when it comes to this lake. And if these kinds of movements, if you want the land to go beyond your vision, you have to work hard to get yourself out. So we, we've now got a team uh, of four women who are slowly ramping up to understand the issues. I mean, I get calls for the craziest thing. Just last week, um, we were all, you know, 10 girlfriends were supposed to go out for dinner, and I get a call from the security guard saying, Madam, come fast, come fast. I said, what happened? There's a man who gets like a woman. I said, okay, great. No, okay, what's the problem? She said, no, he's bleeding. Okay, so I ran there. And, uh, so I ran there, and here's this guy, all oh, like profusely bleeding. He's like been sucked in the chin and his blood. And I said, what happened? And there were these five guys. He said, he's dressed like a woman. I said, so okay, what? He said, but, but it's a man. I said, okay, what did you guys do? And he said, but he was dressed like a woman. I said, just let me tell you what you did to him. And they had punched him because it was, they didn't think that he should be dressed like a woman. And so I had to, you know, send those guys out of the lake. And then this guy, you know, I had to get first aid and, and all of that. And then, you know, I had to get a number for somebody to call. And the poor man was like petrified and he didn't want a police complaint because in India with the laws now it's all crazy. So we have all these kinds of things that happen. And so, Four hours, five hours in a day goes in dealing with not just this or somebody's let their sewage in, somebody's doing, you know, something, they've vandalized the flush in the toilet, whatever. So now we've got a team of four people who will do a lot of that work and then a little bit more with the interface with the government because that's where everybody hates doing it because the government is bureaucratic and all of that. But there is a way to do it. So I am trying by next year to move out and then move to Saudi Arabia to create the same community over there. Um, 
And this lake, again, Kaikamali, we have this thing called Kele Hapa. It's a, it's a lake festival that we do. That's another thing we started two years ago because we want more footfall. If more people come to the lake, they will care about the lake. So if you just have it as something like, you know, oh, it's a, it's a lake over there, um, we found that that doesn't really help. Uh, people get a connect with the lake. So we're trying to create a diverse group of people to come to the lake. And myself setting out. First of all, I just want to add that this whole thing is like really inspiring. Okay. Um, I just was wondering if you're saying that all this switch, a lot of the switch from most abandoned to going into Berlin to the lake, and then if you clean it up and you see how it is, I mean, the fine is all of that switch so is still running throughout the lake, right? Just because of the way the whole system is set up. Does that mean you're going to, um, by uh, cleaning out the lake and putting in these wetlands and the plants, that eventually to be able to deal with? Right. Okay. In, uh, okay. So, so we have another public interest litigation we are public makers uh, <laughs> above uh, Elmgur Lake, where Mantri is. Anybody from Pune? Uh, Mantri is a big name uh, guy from Pune who moved to Bangalore, and he's taken over the real estate business like a storm. And a hundred acres through all kinds of weird deals. He's building uh, the world's largest, I don't know, some five-star hotel, luxury mall, eagles for us, space, something, something. So we're fighting that PIL. That land had 40 acres allocated for treating sewage, a proper sewage treatment plant. And so now we're asking the government, and we've gone up to the Supreme Court, where there is a, something called the National Green Tribunal that has the same um, uh, legitimacy as the Supreme Court. Um, but for green issues. So we've gone to them and we are getting, we've got to stay on his construction. Uh, and that 40 acres, we're trying to retrieve it back. So what we're hoping will happen is that that 40 acres will reinstall that 400 MLD STP. So all the sewage that's coming in will get treated there and then go through the wetland and then get into the lake. Mm -hmm. But until that happens, we are saying we will divert it again because no no solution is a perfect solution. Mm -hmm. But if we can do something that will be incrementally better, we feel that that's a better way to move forward than to wait for the best solution to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, just uh, in Calcutta, the east, east part of Calcutta has had these wetlands for these lakes, which have been a traditional sewage treatment system, right. and they've been completing the sewage. slowly at least coming up. And even with more and more apartments where 
you know, uh, if the water table is coming up a little by little. So, yes. It's called co-governance. Sorry? You know how you were saying you're taking on the government, government's job? It's called co-governance. Co-governance, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we have been talking a lot about uh, how you did it, and it's really very good. Congratulations. More so, I just like to um, ask whether the sustainability of all this uh, work that you have done will continue with all the support from the community as well as from the government without uh, incorporating low conservation-based livelihood or entertainment. Because in many of our countries, especially in the Philippines, water base is a source of income for us. Right. But it doesn't mean destruction. Right. Thank you. I see. Okay. I was accused of um, swallowing a mic as I was a child, so that's why I talk so loudly, I believe. Um, so, um, so this woman, she, she, if you go to Nigeria, if you go to Lagos, you'll see there's all this, you know, weeds. And she had uh, started working with people who are harvesting those weeds, and they're very high fiber. And they're using it to make keychains, reed mats, and things like that. So local artisanal craft and things that do not directly affect the lake, but can take from the lake, can, that can take from the lake and give back to the lake, is something that we can look into. Um, and there might be other other things that we could do that are non-invasive. Um, one of the things that we are looking for or uh, looking to do is to is to work with the government on a policy change and the policy change is that we're we're saying in, we're studying the rules tax rules in many countries and we're finding that if you have a lakefront property in many places your property tax is two or three times higher than those who don't live by a lake so we are going to work with the government and say that's a sustainable way to maintain this lake is that you tax these people because their property prices are going up anyway they're getting the benefits you tax them two or three more times and then peg it to this lake don't peg it to a big bottomless pit somewhere else uh, so we're working on that we don't know how successful it will be and worst case my personal philosophy is that if this doesn't work then we don't value it enough and there will be a time when we will value it enough and somebody else will do it to keep it sustainable. Thank you. After a few weeks of us talking, we realized that the government had come up with a list of lakes to be rejuvenated. So we were like, we have to approach the government. Yeah, I want you to come into that entrance, but go towards the right. So when you think about wanting to do something, which is in the realm of the government, right? You think of, you know, getting the people together, writing a letter, going to the press. But there's a more direct approach. Just go and approach your officials. These are the ones that accompany you everywhere because I can't leave them at home, and so I have to bring them to all the government offices when I have to pester the officials. And it actually helps because I have two kids running around, and you know, and then they are like, I have to take my kids home, I have to feed them, can you please do this fast? So it helps. Lakes in Bangalore are managed by a variety of different government departments. 
So there's the BBMP who actually manages half particular Kaikonradi lake. But in order to remove encroachments around the lake, you have to go to the revenue department. There's a Bangalore sewerage department and the pollution control board. There are, I mean, a whole host of other departments. And we would go from department to department asking them for something, and they would keep telling us, this is not our jurisdiction, go to the next department. But Priya is extremely persistent. She will go after every single official who's important and involved in this and basically annoy them to the point of finally they give in to her. I think we were very lucky because we had one officer, Mr. Satish, who's the chief engineer of the Lakes Division in the BBMP, and he turned out to be someone who was open to engaging with citizens, and that just made for a great partnership. So the good news was they had a plan to rejuvenate this lake, but the bad news was it was not the kind of plan that we had in mind. Hello, Ramesh. Ah, you see the plan. The government approach was a pure engineering approach. Just excavate all the soil, fill in the water, and be done with it. We had gazebos, we had boating, and boating jetties, and areas for electric lights, for an ornamental garden. Because what we really wanted was a lot of space for water. So now our project went into another phase. It was like operation come up with a better plan and come up with it fast. <laughs> I'm Subramania, I'm a bird lover. When the city authorities decided to develop the lake, the whole idea was to increase the water holding capacity. Uh, in the process, they designed the lake in such a way that the lake uh, became a suitable kind of a design. We wanted the lake bed to slope gently from the foreshore towards the main bund, where the deepest zone is, the natural structure that the lake had before, so that the deepest water zone still is very close to the main bund, where the uh, your area can be used by uh, birds like ducks and as you move away from the main one, you have different kinds of birds like uh, egrets, herons, borens using the lake. Okay, so this is all important for birds. Birds. Uh, the bird, you can use birds as an indicator. And now for a boating jetty. And the island should be connected to the lake, right? You don't want that. No, no, there, there should not be a land bridge uh, connecting the mainland. idea of let's clean up the lake and become this proper plan for a biodiverse, self-sustaining, rejuvenating project. We went back to the BBMP office and said let's gently suggest to them what we don't want and what we want and let's see how it plays out. As for birds it becomes an issue. Yeah. We want a place for nesting which is undisturbed. The idea is nice. We'll increase the water yield. We'll take this pathway to the edge and the boating also. It was great because we told him, you know, no boating jetty, we don't want this ornamental garden, we want this. You're pretty, you know, quite a few changes. And he said, yeah, that sounds reasonable, this sounds... Uh, and there were a couple of things he said no to, but then, you know, there were many things he said fine. Okay. Now our priority is, first fix the boundaries, then sit. Then the next thing is we want to prevent the sewage coming into the lake itself. So we'll be constructing a separate line, a diversion line. Where does it go then? If you divert it, it goes to the next day. Naturally, it will go to the next day. But still, you know, there is a permit plan. Maybe in another three, four days. They want, want to make it zero sewage system in all the environments. It was a new approach for us. The Kaiko Namedi residents, local residents came and with a good uh, proposal for implementing this. Because they were the end users. We need to preserve and protect all these lakes for the future generation. I don't want the so future generation of a lake to go 100 kilometers out of Bangalore to, to see a lake. We decided then maybe we should take it just one step further and then get an architect into the picture so that we can give them, you know, plans and the schematics and everything. And then we spent the next five months 
looking for an architect who would do it for free. And then we found a perfect scapegoat. And then we found a perfect scapegoat. <laughs> I am Basu and I'm an architect. I think the refreshing thing about this is no, you have the community the actually the participating, the taking the lead, uh, outlining the requirements and giving a brief to the architect. And I think it would mean that the lake would be that much more contextual. And that so they're trying to make the lake more contextual to the Basu local community. Basu also actually the did all the, the computation of the costs and everything and gave it to the government which otherwise so would have taken the, months for the uh, government to do. You know, just had to sign off the government and gave it to him. Bill of material and they started estimate. working on the they whole process did in the very the drawings, the contractors. They did literally everything that was required. Short of actually going and digging. So <laughs> he said we did everything that was required short of digging on the ground. <laughs> I thought our job was done and in my naivete I thought I'd sit back and wait for the beautiful lake to be delivered, if only it were that easy. The government completely agreed with us, but at the same time, what if the contractor suddenly decides to do something that is not part so we, of the paper? We, we thought we'd just let government the government it. process take So that's where we came in and said, oh and yeah, then we decided we're here, that we discovered we're going to live with this for the rest of our lives. Say that they were 15 workers and they started taking shifts, you know, so everybody was taking their turns to come in and watch the contractor. Hours, also I felt like we were part of the, the solution. So often he would call us and tell us he was a, having a problem. If he couldn't reach the officials, we'd reach the officials for him. So it worked out really well. And then we had months constantly vigilant because there were other things that could undo everything that we had worked hard to do. Landlords who own patches of land on the opposite side of the road, they wanted to push this fence to somewhere where okay. we are standing so because the they said in the eventuality of the road getting wider, uh, we would lose our land which is on the other side of the road. There was fighting and so there was threats to kill. The, fence uh, the goons were all on the other side of the road <laughs> and uh, shouting and putting at us and threatening the government officials okay. and uh, finally the government so sent us. Paramilitary forces. Because every time and we put the, the, the contractor uh, would put something on concrete, they'd come and shake it before the concrete. Midnight and finish right it in the morning. Mm -hmm. So, so that people wouldn't BNPF see that the fence was done. Everyone woke up to a completed fence in the morning. <laughs> but then it got done. So that was two years of our life wasted. Such a problem. After rejuvenation of the grave, we were waiting for the monsoons. And one thing that we had really so argued with the BBMP about the was the need to extend the area of the lake with like and, and, water. Gardens and, everything. and they kept so telling us water. that you're you not going to have enough water coming back into the lake. Because this area is so urban now, it's not going to give you enough of a catchment to actually fill this lake. So we went complete on a gut feeling that we made, as well as talking to the locals here. But then the first month of rain passed, and then the second month of rain passed, and we were in the third month of the monsoon, and we didn't have water in the lake. And we started getting really worried about this, because if we didn't have a drop of water in this expensive restoration of this very large lake, what did this mean for us? Yeah, we forced the and one day, purely by chance, Priya and I and Ramesh were out for a walk to the, in the lake with Priya's kids and my daughter. And water started gushing in. I, water coming in. Yes, I'd say that for all of us. After months of waiting, water coming in. The 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 best it's coming from an upstream, upstream lake. lake. So, so ours had been dredged, and all the water had been, in, and you know, we were waiting for the water three, four months. Then, when that upstream lake overflew, it just gushed. Gushed in. in. September, right? In September seventh. Do you remember the date? Yep. <laughs> It's no easy task for four or five people to keep an eye on the lake. It's an urban common, so it's dynamic. But quietly, miraculously, something lovely was happening. This lake was becoming this place for animals and birds. And it also became this meeting point for lots of people who wanted to do something 
larger than themselves but didn't know where to begin. My name is David Lewis. I volunteer to take care of the lake. He's fixing everything at the lake. In my old age, I wanted to have a small piece of land to grow some trees and plants and flowers and have some fun. God has given me this 48 acres to take care as my own. God has given me 48 acres to take care of as my own. I very happy. My own. <laughs> so. I was always curious about this small patch of green that is about a few uh, hundred meters from the road. So one day I just walked by and said, let me have one a look at I just walked by. You have to be in Bangalore to understand why it's special. Yeah, you there are hardly any lakes worth going to. Smell a lake in Bangalore <laughs> faster than you can see it. I said, I would love to be part of this because if I am getting this, so I should do something about this. after working on it that it was part of a chain of lakes. So unless we all, all the lakes up, up, upstream and downstream think as one, there's no point just looking after this one lake because something that happens up there could destroy this lake and something that we do wrong could destroy a lake down. So the ecosystem has to be extended to the whole lake chain. So after having worked for many years and the lake is now starting to look and feel like a nice ecosystem. We had asked the government to rejuvenate this whole chain. And they started what is called dewatering of the upstream lakes, but those lakes are extremely polluted with sewage. So all of that just started flowing into Kaikon Rally. We just couldn't stop it because there was monsoon, the volume of water was lots, laced with sewage, fish were dying, turtles. It was one of the saddest moments for me in this whole process. And we're still dealing with it. We're still dealing with it. Rainy Lagona. There are a lot of developers who would give anything to get this space. Try and land, right? There are a lot of developers who are eyeing this prime land. This is fighting a battle. This is fighting a battle. Look at the sea. Look at the sea. Look at the sea. You have construction there, like in the background. You have a large construction there. You have another big construction happening at the back. And then you will soon have constructions happening here in the corner. To build these concrete structures, you need labor. And the easy way to accommodate labor is to build shanties till your construction is over for a period of a year or so. The biggest consequence of this is the 
and all the sewage and all the water that they use, they just let it go straight the into the lake. Of this is all sewage and the water that they use. Well, but this the building was just about starting and they were digging for foundation. They had about 400 laborers in tin sheds right on the edge of this fence. And normally, they will have common toilets. And then they will suck the thing out and they will go and dispose it. But here, there was an easy access to a lake. Why do all that? So they just built a little channel so it would come into the lake. And so we had raw sewage from 400 laborers coming into the lake. And so we tried everything. We called the officials and they all did their job. You know, which is by the book, give them the notice, you have to give three notices, and then you have to wait. And so it was two months and this was going on. And after a point, we just lost our patience. I mean, like, you know, the officials are doing their job. These people continue to flout it. And we see that this lake that we care about is getting inundated with sewage. So I said, fine, you know what? I'm going to be this pit bull that I'm reputed to be. And I got the number for the guy whose job it is, is to enforce the uh, notice. And I said to him, you know, you know, can you do this? And he said, yeah, I'm trying, I'm trying. We'll, we'll take care of it. We have lots of other things to do. So I published this number in an email to many, many people, you know, who care about the lake. Everybody started calling the guy. Uh, and I told them, call him. Every moment you get today, just call the guy. <laughs> so I think he got so many calls that by the evening, he called me and he said, Madam, I will take care of it, Madam. And then in 24 hours, all the laborers were shifted out and there was no more service. So you have to do these kind of like crazy things to get the job done. <laughs> My name is Meera and I'm an editor at a news magazine. So when I came across this story and I said, well, we should share these stories online. And, uh, and that's what we did. We started documenting many of the stuff uh, that was happening here, the changes they're trying to make, the challenges they were facing. And slowly these stories started to influence more and more people. And uh, now if you look at it, there are probably around a dozen lakes in the city which are, you know, in various stages of rejuvenation or having been completed. I realized that there was another lake that was being developed, you know, where Kaipa was Priya was already involved and there was Ramesh involved. And I meet Ramesh and he's this super energetic guy and he's like, what you to do this and why don't you do that? And he's, he was really motivating. So the fact that these guys were ahead in the game from us helped us to be able to learn. And So basically we were the scapegoats. We did everything and we did it wrong and everybody else said, oh, they did it wrong. Let's not do it that way. <laughs> I've realized in this whole exercise that if people like me don't get into the mainstream political system, and work with the system rather than sit out and criticize and crib and do nothing about it, we're not going to get change. So that's where I'm headed. <laughs> Development in city act as the Jotinelli now public properties to save Matta Parvodo. Adana in next generation again, enjoy moderating and look out to Pombodo. The beauty of the Kaikondali Lake story for me is that a bunch of ordinary people, quite clueless to begin with, can start this major journey which is difficult and challenging to restore this lake, can learn a lot in the process, can have something successful to show that we can be proud of, and can now have something to teach other people who want to start this journey. And I think it just shows you the power of belief in possibility and the power of collective action. I have a real sense of satisfaction I for at least seeing that the beautiful lake with a lot of birds, trees and people enjoying the people environment. Enjoying trees. Lots of things around us are a mess. So if you let it overwhelm us, then we'll just be paralyzed. If you see something around you that you want to change, just go for it, you know. It might be a hard journey, but you won't know unless you just go for it.
when the lake breached and all that sewage was coming in? And how, how did that happen exactly? Uh, so, so we <laughs> discovered in this process that this was a lake in a chain of right. lakes. And so we went and petitioned the government with the same gusto that we did for this, saying, rejuvenate those lakes. And the process of rejuvenation involves dewatering, removing the water. But because the natural gradient is such that if they remove the water from that lake, it would come to us. We didn't know that. We didn't think about it. So then it just all started inundating. <coughs> so if you have to do it again, you would start from the top? Yes. And that's what we recommended that the media be do from now on. Yes, or, and also we have other processes in place. So we have this rejuvenated lake. This is about two, two and a half years ago this film was made. So I just wanted to give you a brief of what else um, has been going on. If you could just go forward, please. So we had to then officially form a trust so that we can interface with the government, not on this loose sort of way, so that we can have a code of you know how to do these things, best practices, and all of that. And people won't question why why we are talking to them because this real estate, there's, you know, mafia, there's all kinds of people involved and everybody want to get uh, into this. So, so yeah, so we have a trust now. And then we have evolved a vision for the lake. So there are lots of choices. So in, urban, in an urban context, you could just say, okay, it's for the walkers and the joggers and the cyclists and the bird watchers. So we said, okay, no, would you go back, please? Uh, so, so there are parts of it that we leave wild so that there is more biodiversity, flora, fauna, everything. And then if you want to keep the people interested, and you have to have, we've discovered, have people interested, and a diverse group of people interested. So we have some parts that we manicure. We try and we only use native species. But they're beautiful. There's a gazebo, and there's like a little bit like orange trellis and things like that. Um, then, you know, a lot of uh, joggers, walkers come. And then we have these people who are traditional. They've been fishing. Uh, there was a guy who was fishing at the lake for many, many, many years, many generations. And his um, his family would actually come to us and say, ma'am, your birds have come, which is the painted stocks and the pelicans, they've started coming to our lake in hundreds. Uh, and then he'd say, your birds have come, so I'm not going to fish for three months now. Okay. Right? And so that to create that kind of an interest in that kind, they feel that they are stakeholders as much as I am is to give spaces for people to do what they like best instead of forcing them into saying, we think the lake's vision is this, and you should now do this, right? Could you go to the next one, please? So we're, we're as inclusive, we work very hard. It's a very messy situation to be inclusive in India because there's language, there's caste, there's class, there are, you know, there's all kinds of things. And there's um, accessibility, people who are disabled versus people who are not. People who have dogs, people who don't like dogs, you know, and all of that. And so we work very hard, however messy it is, we work very hard to keep it inclusive because that's the vision of the lake. And then, so for instance, some of these things have turned out to be very symbiotic. Um, so we used to pay for the tea meeting. Now these people come, uh, the, the only people who are allowed motorized vehicles inside the lake are the people who own cattle. So they come, they cut their grass, and they take it back to their cattle. So they get fresh grass, which they haven't got for many, many years in Bangalore. And therefore, we don't have to pay for the de-weeding. So that works out very well. And all this is, nothing is by design. It's just like, it happened. We just thought we'd do something good, and it all happened. Um, so uh, again, like I said, that is complicated. So we have an amphitheater, which again, when we started, it was like, oh, there's no open space for this amphitheater. We should all have cultural program. And then the first thing that happened was there was this politician wanted to come and give speeches in Europe. Okay. So we then worked to create something called the Lake Monitoring Committee, which involves us. It involves a funding partner and it involves the BBMP. And unless there's an unanimous decision, we can't do so we veto everything that we don't mm -hmm. think is conservation. So then over a period of time we've set it only conservation events. Even though cultural events would be good, but soon it'll lead to many issues. Um, uh, so, so currently, Bangalore has a policy that wherever you have uh, lakes and tanks, you can immerse Ganesha idols. Um, and so we talked to the government, and we said that's all wonderful, and we, you know, we clean up the tank. And that is an old tree where, for two hundred and something years, uh, they have, they come and they 
slaughter a goat and everybody comes in red saris and whatever, as distasteful as it is to me, it's part of the tradition, so we don't stand in the way of those kinds of traditions because they are also stakeholders. Uh, but we also are telling the government, if tomorrow somebody wanted to do a baptism, we will stand for it. So we have to make those kind of uh, uh, statements quite boldly, otherwise it becomes polarized towards one religion and all of that. Photographers, unfortunately, they want to get the closest shot of the birds and everything. And in, in the process, there a lot of them disturb uh, the birds. Our conflict is, is with people who actually want to uh, look at wildlife. So again, we're working with them. We have photo exhibitions using their photographs, only taken with this lens. And I'm a filmmaker. <laughs> if you did, if you went into the bun, you know, it's that kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> Okay, the other thing that we found out was this whole thing, we have this in an urban, very, very dynamic context, we have a fence, and we're saying this is 48 acres, and we can go to the next one. Uh, it's 48 acres, and we are going to protect this. But everything around it affects what comes in. And so, first we were fighting, saying, all that's outside stays outside, but now we've said, okay, let's let it all come in. We will figure out a way to deal with it because resistance is much harder to do than acceptance. So we have, this area does not have underground drains. This is how badly this area is designed. And it has everybody who's moved from the US, UK, New Zealand, Australia, come to Bangalore, want to buy, buy swank apartments, they come to this area. And they let they treat their sewage water, and then it's let out. And because the lakes are designed in such a way that they flow to the lowest point because of physics, it comes into our lake. So uh, so that's the foaming that happens when, when that happens. And so we worked with the BBMP and also from learning from the experience of when the other lakes were dewatered. So we, we told them to create these diversion drains, which they were already working on uh, creating. So in the dry season, so earlier, uh, what used to happen hundreds of years ago is that these were community managed lakes and they would have a dry season and a wet season. The dry season, nothing would come into the lake. The wet season was the monsoon season. So now we are getting water all the time, right? Because everybody's sewage is coming in. So we create these diversion drains and we follow the dry season. So we will let everything, we block all the sewage from entering the lake and it, it leaves to the next lake, which now we're in charge of also. Um, but in the wet season, we have to allow that to come in. So we let the historical sewage, so anything that's been sitting there has inflowed. So the first three days, we and we have this very scientific way. If it looks like tea or color, then we let it in, right? <laughs> so, so we don't have anything very advanced to check the water and everything. But we know from the fishermen says if it comes like muddy water as opposed to black or gray, then we're fine. So it dilutes the water. The sewage uh, is diluted by the rainwater. We wait for two, three days for this historical sewage to go away, and then we let it in. And over the period of a few years, we've got a bigger wetland. And the wetland sort of bioremediates, that takes away all the nutrients from which the people who are getting the cattle, they get all their grass and take it. So it's working out well. So by allowing that in, we're harvesting something good and not spending most of our energies on something else. Ah, so this, these, uh, we also, when we have to, and when push comes to shove, we have filed public interest litigations. Uh, so this is, upstream of our lake, and there's another lake upstream that we are also looking after. Now that we petitioned the government to look after to rejuvenate these lakes, they said, oh, we, we did it for you, here it is now, it's on a platter. Take it, fund it, look after it, do everything. So we have more than some 200 acres of lakes that we're looking after, we have no idea what we're doing. But um, that is a sensitive zone between two lakes, and they don't look at these as living lakes with living bodies of water and soil in between. So they allow that, because it's private land, they allow people to build on those lands. And they have their environmental care and everything because they're not thinking about what effect it will have. There'll be flooding, there'll be all kinds of things. So we filed a public interest litigation uh, you know, to protect the space. And this I already mentioned, this is uh, people. Uh, again, this is uh, where there's a school uh, next to the lake where when we started the work, they, it's a, a partially funded government school, so they're poor kids, uh, high school kids, and they had encroached on one side of the lake for a playground. So we worked with the government. The, it, the first reaction is, oh, it's an encroachment, shut it down, 
and uh, no access to these kids. So we said, well, there's no physical encroachment. They use it for a cocoa team and for their kabaddi practice and to eat their lunch and to do their uh, morning assembly. So we started working with the school and say, you do that, don't create a structure here. We'll support you in the handling because you don't have a, a space to play. Now these kids are the uh, Kabaddi and Coco district champions. And every year, the top uh, mark holder, happens to be a girl always, um, <laughs> we, we send an email out saying so and so has stopped the thing. And within 24 hours, we will raise 40,000, 50,000 because everybody writes in and says, I want to give for her further education. So we're funding a lot of services. That's the kind of connections we've been able to make uh, for these kids. Again, can you go back? That are, those are all, all the lakes. Um, so this is 48 acres, Kaikon Ali, the lake that you saw. This is Kasuan Ali, which is our upstream lake. And this is the area where we're fighting the PIL. Then there's Harulur, so we've taken up this lake, this lake, this lake, and then Saul Kere, which is actually in a good shape. And now we are working on this lake. We are trying to mine the sewage. This is another part of what we are doing and trying to think about how to let the things outside come and benefit the lake. So we've just decided what does the lake need for, a, for it to sustain. And so there is a, a company called Eco Paradigm that is actually creating a system. We've done flow studies and everything. They come and they're creating a system. We have a valve system. It gets mined the sewage gets treated and it gets led into the lake so that the lake can fill. And we'll control how much water comes in and does it. Um, this is the biggest lake, it's a thousand acre lake in Bangalore and the most polluted if anybody lives in India, uh, mm -hmm. you would have seen this is where all the foam is flying and all of that. So because of our work on all, of, and that's the other small lake also that we're looking after. Because of our work uh, at, uh, on all of these lakes, we are also involved in lots of lakes in the area. So our main aim is to keep it local, get local people around these lakes to do what they need and we become the support system. I think that's it. Is there any more? Or heck yeah? This is our constituency, our parliamentary constituency. What is it in terms of acreage? It is the largest, oh God, I'm so terrible at anything with real information. Um, <laughs> it has, it has, um, I can tell you the voter registration rolls has 50,000 families, this area. So that's all, that's the number I know. And in square footage, it's the largest constituency in, in Bangalore. It's very, very big. So you, you could drive from here to one edge would be 14 kilometers this way. Oh, so you can calculate it. And yeah, maybe another 20 kilometers this way, whatever that Make sense? I don't know math. <laughs> Is there anything else? Right, so I, I just talked about the stormwater drains. So the stormwater drains that actually carry the water between lakes is all private land, but they expect the private landowner to work in the common interest. But it's not happening. It used to before, but it's not anymore. So again, we keep you know, working on it. But anyway, it flows down to our lakes. But the ideal thing would be to have these stormwater drains restored, and we're working on that. Um, yeah, those are called Raj Kalways. And then there are, there are buffer zones. So one of the things we've done, uh, there's a Supreme Court ruling that says that uh, 30 meters from the fence of a lake, nobody's allowed to build, and everybody's building. So we first went and again, you know, talked to the government, they gave notices and all of that and it hasn't, nothing has happened. So now we are in the process of actively co-opting all these people and I was telling somebody here the other day, on January 26, which is our Republic Day, uh, they, this apartment came and said, oh, we want to, you know, celebrate this beautiful lake and all the work you guys have done. Uh, come and raise the flag in our uh, apartment complex. And we said, we don't want to do that. You bring your people to the lake. Let them see what the lake is about. So they came to the lake, and then they donated one lakh rupees to the lake uh, because they saw what was happening. And so then, of course, we sent them a thank you note saying, this does not buy you any special rights. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but they are seeing the value in something like this. Right? And by standing our ground on very, very apolitical, we work with every political party, we bash everybody, but, but just saying that this is a lake and this is all, we're like a, you know, one song record, that's all we care about, 
and all the lake system. I think we're starting to see that we're setting the bar higher than it was before, which was very low before, <laughs> and now it's also quite low. Is that it? And yeah, so, so that's that. Any questions? Have you used any of the plants, specifically the herbs like centella and bacopa, that actually clean water? Yes. So, so what we do is we, as a trust, we say that we want to look after these lakes, but we don't get involved in any of the expertise. So we have Himanjali as part of a group uh, called Bio. They do a lot of the thinking in terms of the bioremediation of the sewage. They come, they present. We say to the government, to other scientists, we present what they present and say, does this sound good to you guys? And if they say it sounds good, we implement it. So I don't even know the names of the plants. So, but yes, uh, so there's the sewage remediation, there's, we do Abbey fauna studies, everything, everybody just comes and does their bits and we ask other people to peer review it. And then if, uh, if it is because we just don't want to be the people curating everything. And one more question. Yes, sir. What happened to the golden Dragonflies. <laughs> Unfortunately, two bad things happened uh, at the lake. Um, so there are lots of dragonflies, but those that species, I think, was a very sensitive species. So that has not returned. So I am to blame for that. And the other thing is, I have a well. You saw a big well with steps mm -hmm. in the thing. I have a similar well in my house, and all public work starts with very selfish motives. I live very close to the lake, and it used to have water up to the top fifth step. And after we dredged the lake and cleaned everything, I don't get much water in my lake, in my well, because everything's going to the lake. So that's a lesson I'm doing really good work. It's never really done before. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. Have you thought of work on the Dillon Book? Yes, one of the challenges different. Yes, uh, very different. It's a thousand acre lake which gets all the sewage of everybody in Bangalore. You flush it toilet, it goes to Bellamy. Um, and so the budget to rejuvenate that lake is equal to the budget of Karnataka, the whole state. Right? Of water, water, not the whole state, but the water and sewage the same. So we are working on getting detailed project reports and building a community and building pressure. So I think we are somewhere close to saying that in the next five years we may do something good. And that's what it takes. It's, this is eight years progress. My, my son was... Uh